But we'll be in the Old Testament tonight, uh, Joshua chapter 14. And I'm going to allude to some other things tonight. But uh, faith and holy following God, I've been reading through Joshua. And uh, the Lord pointed me to this passage. And there's a phrase that Caleb said that just jumped out. And uh, God wouldn't let me let go of it. And, and so that's where we're going to be. Um, I'm grateful for the things he's doing. I'm grateful that we can have confidence and faith in our God. I'm grateful we don't have to wonder if he's really there or if he really loves us. And I know sometimes in the flesh we may ask that and we may be concerned, is God there? Is he love us? And usually it's those times when we're looking on ourselves and licking our own wounds um, and we kind of get that pity party going on or we start looking at the circumstances. But thank God for men of character like Caleb and Joshua. Let us go to the Lord uh, in prayer one more time. And we'll dive into his word. Father, we're grateful and thankful for the opportunity to meet tonight. You know, you've been so good to us. And Lord, we're so undeserving. But Father, we thank you that you love us anyway. We thank you for your mercy, your grace. Father, thank you for your word. Father, the truth you share with the promises you give to us, Lord. Thank you for being good to us. And Lord, help us that we might honor you and live for you. Lord, as we look into your word tonight, we pray that you have your way. In Christ's name, amen. To kind of set the stage of what's going on in, uh, in Joshua here, Joshua's been divvying out some land to uh, the children of Israel right, by tribes, and, and Caleb's coming along. But this goes way back to Numbers 13 and 14. It was the account of uh, Israel searching out the Canaan land, before they entered in. In Numbers 13 and 1, it said, The Lord spake, Moses, send thou that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. And that was a statement that God had made, which means therefore it was truth, which means therefore it was a promise that God had made to Israel. He said, I'm giving you Canaan land. I want you to send some guys to go check it out, but nevertheless, I'm giving you this land. That right there should have settled it, should have been case closed. But you know the story and you know it's not. Twelve spies go in and search out the land. And they didn't just spend a couple days, it was 40 days. You know, I often forget that they spent 40 days searching out the land. That's a long time. It's a lot of land. But as they were searching, you know, they found that it was flowing with milk and honey, meaning it was prosperous. They even brought back samples of the fruit. Clusters of grapes that they had to hold on staves between two guys. That's pretty amazing. Huge clusters. I know if you had to try to buy that today at the grocery store, it cost you an arm and a leg. Boy, grapes have gone up. Especially you get them cotton candy grapes. I kind of wonder if they didn't have any cotton candy grapes in the land that's flowing with milk and honey. Whether they did or not, I don't know. But I'm sure there was some sweet and good fruit that they had. And they had pomegranates and other things that they brought back and looked to. But they brought them back. And it's amazing that 12 guys had enough faith to go out and walk and search out the land. And it's amazing that 12 guys had enough faith to bring back samples from the land. But what's even more amazing, and maybe not in a good way, is only two guys had something good to say about the land. You know the story. There was 10 that had the negative arguments, right? He said, those folks that dwell in those cities, they're strong. Not only are they strong, but the cities are fortified with walls. And not only are there walls, some of the land's got giants. There's no way we can take this. We can't do it. They seen the prosperous situation God had for them. They knew the promise that God had given to them. But in the moment, they looked at the flesh and said, we can't do this. Maybe they needed some assurance from God. Who knows? I don't know how much more assurance from God do you need than him saying, I'm going to give you this land. But they failed and they faltered. Numbers 13.30, Caleb stealed the people for Moses and he said, let us go up at once. So as the, the, the ten guys were talking negative, Caleb comes up. He says, guys, relax. We got this. God gave us the promise. Let's go. Let's go get what he gave us. I, I, I could see the energy in Caleb. As he's just, oh, come on, guys. 
God told us we're going to have this land. Look at the stuff we brought back. It doesn't matter what's out there. God delivered us out of the land of Egypt. Uh, we, all the times that he led us. This is nothing for God. Let's go. But Israel faltered. Ten guys said no. Two guys, Caleb and Joshua, said let's do it. Numbers 14, 18, it said, If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. That again is Caleb speaking there. But because of Israel's disbelief, God was set to smite the nation of Israel. You'll find that in Numbers 14. God told Moses, I can wipe this people out, and I'll make of you an even greater nation. <laughs> and he could have. But Moses had to remind God, you know, you delivered your people out of Egypt. Egypt knows what took place. And if you destroy your people here, then it's going to be spread around that the God who brought Israel out of Egypt is not able to deliver them into the land that he promised. Well, what a compelling argument by Moses. <laughs> Reminding God that he made a promise. Did God need a reminder? No, I think God was just putting it in Moses' heart so that Moses would make the argument, so that Moses continued to be the leader he needed to be. But because of Israel's disbelief, God wanted to smite them. But Moses sought on the mercy and forgiveness of the God of Israel and reminded them how he led them, cloud by day and fire by night. That, man, that, that'd kind of be wonderful, right? We had that block party the other day. And that cloud came over for about 15 minutes on that hot, blistering day. And when that cloud was, it was wonderful. It wasn't a Shekinah glory cloud, but we welcomed that cloud anyway. But I can only imagine as Israel was traveling in the heat of the day, as God was leading them with the cloud, the coolness that was over them. How could you not know that God was with you? And then at nighttime as you traveled, the fire that led the way. How could you not know that God was with you? When God was ready for them to stop, the cloud quit moving or the fire quit moving. They set up tent. When it was time to move, the cloud move or the fire move. It's real easy. God made it easy, and yet Israel in the flesh forgot the power of their God. And more importantly, they forgot the promise of their God and our God. It's interesting that God reminded Moses that those in Israel, as they're having this conversation, saw his deliverance of them from Egypt and saw all the miracles that God did. And there was 10 different times that Israel tempted the Lord as they were traveling. And I forget about that, too, sometimes that they they whined so much 10 different times they tempted the Lord. And he was really frustrated with his people. I would be too. It takes a lot less to get me frustrated. But God was frustrated with his people. And yet because of Moses, someone intervening, God had mercy. But he did say they're going to wander in the wilderness 40 years. And that generation that saw the miracles and that was delivered, yeah, they won't be allowed to enter in. Except for Caleb and Joshua. Those two guys will be able to go in. And it was a promise that God himself gave to Caleb that the land that he tread upon, God was going to give to him. During this time, Caleb was about 40 years old. Let's go to our text now, Joshua chapter 14, beginning verse 6. It says, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua and Gilgal. Then Caleb the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said unto him, Thou knowest the thing the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee in Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord, my God. See, Caleb had it in his heart the whole time that he was going to serve God no matter what. He had it in his heart the whole time that he was going to believe God at his promise. He had it in his heart the whole time that he was going to serve God wholly. And that's W-H-O-L-L-Y. That means with everything. 
And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance, and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. It's interesting that God's promise to Caleb was because he not only had the faith and believed God at his promise, but was because he wholly followed the Lord. In everything in his life, he gave to God. In all his actions that he did, he gave to God. And no matter how impossible it was, he gave it to God. And God said, because, basically because of your faith, Caleb, you wholly followed me, that land's going to be yours. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive. And said, These forty five years, ever since the Lord spake his word unto Moses while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. So at forty years, he went and spied out the land. Forty five years later, he's now eighty five. He said, Lo, I'm this day fourscore and five years old. I'm eighty five years old. And here's an amazing statement. He says, Yet I am strong this day I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so my strength now for war both to go out and to come in. How amazing. That's Caleb's testimony as he followed the Lord wholly, as he kept the faith in his God, as he walked with God, as he gave everything in his life to God, as he led his family with God, as he wandered in the wilderness with the rest of the people. Forty years. And I have to think that if he wholly followed the Lord, that he may have never ever questioned, God, what are you trying to do? But yet he had faith the whole time that he was wandering around that God was still going to do what God promised him. I have to believe that because he says he wholly followed the Lord. I feel that in Caleb there was no wavering. Caleb didn't sometimes say, yeah, God can do this, or no, I don't know if God can do it this time. But Caleb was solid in, in believing that God was going to do what God said he would do. What a strange concept, Christian, <laughs> that God's going to do what he said he's going to do. And yet we find ourselves in life today wondering if God's going to do what he said he's going to do. And God will lead us and put on our heart to do something. He'll say, all right, God, do you really want me to do that? If God didn't really want you to do that, He wouldn't lead you to it. You say, well, maybe He's leading me to something that He's just trying to try my faith a little bit. There's that too. But if you're wholly following the Lord and that's the case, if He leads you to it and He don't have it for you, He'll send you another direction. But we don't have to sit and question and wait on the Lord with perplexity. If God's already told us, if God's already shown us. Yeah, we're told to wait on the Lord. There's times we need to wait on the Lord, and that's when He hasn't given us a new direction to go. And guess what? If you're not given a new direction to go, what direction you're supposed to go? On the path that He's already got you on. And while you're on it, you wait on the Lord. That means serve Him. And that's what Caleb did. Caleb was brought to the promised land. He got to go through it, and that was the direction that he was led, and he went, and he walked, and he seen, and he said, Yes, God, we can do this. And then he had to go on a new path, not because of his lack of belief, but because of the lack of belief of others. And he had to go on a new path. And yet during that whole time on the new path, he wholly followed the Lord. We could learn a lot from Caleb today. I know sometimes Christians, and I'm guilty of myself from time to time, and I've seen others when something bad happens, all of a sudden we just fall apart. Oh, how could God let this happen? He causes the rain on the just and the unjust. Stuff happens, folks. That doesn't mean God's any less in control. That doesn't mean God's any less sovereign. That doesn't mean that God's any less able to handle any situation that comes about. That just means that He's got a plan you need to wait on. 85 years old, he was just as strong as he was when he was 40. That's pretty amazing. I'm 47, and I think my strength at 40, I wasn't all that strong. I'd much rather be as strong as I was when I was 20. They were built a little bit different then, I think. Them hot days, they could walk around, it was nothing. Today, I stepped outside, <gasps> I can't breathe in this. We got spoiled. <laughs> uh, but Caleb wasn't. He said, 85 years old, I'm just as strong as I was then. I can go to war just like I could then. If that's so what God wants me to do, 
In verse 12, he said, Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day, for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so, the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. And that if was no question. And Caleb was in question if God was willing. He knew God was willing because he remembered the promise. And it was more like, rather, if the, so be, since the Lord will be with me. He had no doubts and no questions that God was with him. He said, give me that land and I'm going to do what he wanted me to do the first time. I'm going to go drive them out. And I'm going to do it because the Lord said. Amen. How many times did we would just do something because the Lord said and, and, and let the outcome be his outcome? Would things be so much better in life? And yet so many times we want to get in and try to manipulate it or try to have the strength of flesh there, the strength of man, and have confidence in what man can do. And folks, every time if we have confidence in what man can do, they're going to fail us. They're going to fail us. We would have confidence in what God can do. Man's strength caused Israel to wander 40 years and a whole generation to die out. A whole generation that witnessed miracles after miracle after miracle died because of lack of faith, because of unbelief. Wow. Some things are mentioned about Caleb was his belief in God's promise or his faith. In Hebrews 11, 1, the Bible tells us that faith is the substance or the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence or the conviction of things not see, seen. And that, that sums up what faith really is. That when you're walking in faith, it's not because you see it and you know for sure it's happening because you've done it before. Although God strengthens our faith with those things. But faith comes in when maybe we hadn't seen it before. And we're not sure that we can do it. But we know that God can. The simplest form of faith that we all must come to is faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. There is no way we can get to heaven on our own. It is impossible. It is impossible. And yet because of faith, we can come to God and we can get to heaven. Amen. Caleb believed God when Moses told him that God would give the land to Israel. Now, Caleb believed that when he was 40 and first by the land, that uh, he still believed, maybe even had a greater faith that God would give him the land at 85. Caleb's strength has not failed him for 45 years. What about today? I talk about a lot of promises that Caleb had. Promises that we have today that we can cling to. And I just mentioned one, but Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's God's word, and, and he made that promise. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you put your faith in what Jesus did, and, and you trust in that. And call upon the name of the Lord, ask him to save you. can have faith in that. And that's why we're here tonight. We've put our faith in Jesus Christ. Most on a Sunday night already know Jesus Christ is our Savior. I don't say everybody does, but generally, you're more faithful to be here. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a wonderful promise to hang on to. You know what that means? Those days when, when I'm having a rough day and when you're having a rough day, that, that we can have a, a promise that we're saved. It doesn't go by how we feel that day. We may feel like we're worthless that day. There's many days where I say, oh, God, how in the world can you love me? Uh, whosoever called upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I remember the promise, the assurance that he gives us. In John 14, 1, he tells us, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, too. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. There's another promise. Jesus said it, and we can believe it and take it to the bank, and that's our hope. Our hope is that we will, when we die, spend eternity in heaven. Where Jesus is preparing a place. That's two wonderful promises to hang on. So sometimes when, when things are rough down here on earth and it ain't going the way you want it to go, <laughs> cling to that promise. There's coming a day 
where Jesus is coming to get me. He prepared a place for me. I'm just waiting for him to get it done. Promise of 1 John 5, 4, So whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Hey, you've overcome the world. We wrote that in 1 John. You're an overcomer. Man, Jesus sang that song so much so I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> Wonderful song. Wonderful lyrics. We are overcomers. That doesn't mean that it don't get tough sometimes. It gets rough and tough and hard. But we're overcomers. There's an end that's coming, and we're an overcomer because of what Jesus did, not because of anything that we've done. We're an overcomer because of Christ. That's a promise that we have. We've overcome the world. <laughs> the victory that overcometh the world is in our faith because we believe in Jesus, the Son of God. Oh, and then Jesus told his disciples, and it applies to the rest of us in John 4, 20, 14, 26, when he said, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And I realized he was talking to the disciples and the, the things that were getting ready to take place because he was going to be crucified and their world was going to be turned upside down. But don't you know that that promise is still alive and well today, that God does send his Holy Spirit for the one who trusts in Jesus Christ as their Savior, that the Holy Spirit still leads and he still guides and he still comforts. There's no difference. And he gives us peace. Isn't it great to have peace as you walk this world? There's so much garbage going on in this world. It is great to go down at night, the head on my pillow with peace in my mind and in my heart. Knowing that God still got it under control. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to hold I pray nothing horrible happens. But regardless, I can go to bed with peace. I have faith that whatever takes place, and you can have faith that whatever takes place, that God said he'll be with you. He'll be with you, and he'll walk through with you. Every time I give my kids the key to a vehicle, and say, go get this, or go do this, or say, can I go somewhere? And I give them a key. I have faith they're going to return. He said, what happens if one day they don't? I got faith, and I know where they're going. I know where they're going. I don't want to get to that situation. It could happen for anyone. We don't know what's going to take place. We're not promised tomorrow. But I have faith that no matter what takes place, God is there and he'll get you through. Oh, here's a beautiful promise. Revelation 20 and 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever. <laughs> that old devil, all his henchmen, the demonic demons, the ones that like to tempt you, like to try to get you to stumble and fall. The ones that like to whisper in your ear, you can't do that. You're no good. It was promised there's a day coming they'll be cast. The fire and brimstone, they'll be cast into hell, and then hell will be cast into the lake of fire forever. No more tempted. Hey, next time the enemy gets in here and tries to tell you you're not worthy, just remind him, hey, we got a promise. We got a promise there, Satan. We got a promise, demons of Satan, that you're going to be cast into hell one day, never to bother us anymore. Remind him. How does saying go when, when Satan reminds you of your past, reminding him of his future? That sounds simple, but try it out. In Revelation 21, we're promised about the new heaven and earth. The old heaven and earth will pass away, and, and there's a holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down, and prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And in those verses, it tells us that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, sorrow, crying, neither shall there be any more pain. That's a promise. 
that we can hold on to. So yeah, it might get tough and hard sometimes, but we got promises that we can walk, uh, hold on to as we walk this weary land. And he said, the second thing about Caleb was that he wholly followed the Lord. I just mean Caleb served the Lord. He loved the Lord. He served him. Caleb's life belonged to God. It wasn't his own life. He decided that he was going to do it for God no matter what. Caleb lived in a manner that glorified and honored the Lord. And we as Christians too, that's how we're to live. To honor the Lord and glorify Him with our life. We got to be careful because the flesh likes to get the glory out of things. We do. I don't know anybody that don't appreciate a good attaboy. I tell you what's amazing now is people that expect something out of, uh, out of nothing. You go to a restaurant now, or you go, you know, not a restaurant, you know, you get a, a, a waitress or a waiter at a restaurant, customer, give a tip, they're waiting on you. That's one thing. But you go up now to pay a cashier at anywhere, really, and you get a pop up wanting a tip. <laughs> wanting a tip for what? Doing your job? Oh, wait a minute. Oh, man. We got an expectant attitude today. But Caleb had an attitude that his life belonged to God and he was to live holy. And we're to live holy and we're to be a living sacrifice. Why? Because it's our reasonable service, is what Paul told us. We're to follow his leading, regardless how impossible it may seem. Luke 18 and 27, we're told that the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. When God's in him and God's directing you to it, it might seem impossible. It might seem like there's no way I can do it, but with God, all things are possible. And I understand that was talking about the camel going through the eye of a needle, the rich man getting to heaven. But the application is still the same. It still applies to anything that with God, all things are possible. Again, where the arm of flesh fails, God remains. We're to allow him to be the Lord of our life. Proverbs 3, 5 says this way, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, lean not on thy own understanding, understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Beautiful proverb. I had that taped in my mirror for a long time. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. In all thy ways. In all thy ways. In all thy ways. That means there's not any way that I should go in my own way, but that in everything I do and everything you do, we should give it to God and acknowledge Him. He said, but aren't some things just standard? Sure. But I acknowledge God in all my ways. Why? In case I might slip and fall. In case I might come across an obstacle and be caught off guard. In all my ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct my paths. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll direct thy paths. We've been redeemed. We've been bought with a price. We're no longer to live for self, but to serve the one who died for us. To wholly follow God means to trust him with the little things and the big things, the easy things and the hard things. You know, so it's a lot easier to trust God with the hard things than it is with the easy things. Because the easy things, we're tempted to do it in our own flesh and tempted to do it uh, the way we've always done it or uh, the way that seems easy to do. But we're still to give those things in all thy ways, acknowledge him in the easy things. Things that are possible. Again, we get tempted to do things that are possible in our own flesh. But in all our ways, acknowledge him. And then in the impossible things. In the impossible things is when we want to give up. So with the possible things, we run into the uh, possibility of living in the flesh. And in the impossible things, we run into the possibility of giving up. But if we're acknowledging him in all our ways, <laughs> he's going to direct our paths. How do you know that, Brother David? Because he said, he gave it to us in his word. And if there's any part of his word that I can't believe, then I can't believe any of his word. If just one part's false, it's all false. But if it's all true, then it's all true. And so I got to believe if I acknowledge him in all my ways, he'll direct my paths. 
So do you acknowledge him in all your ways? Caleb did. He believed God and he showed it by how he lived. My question tonight is how about you? Are you living out the faith that you say you have? Are you living and basing your life upon the promises that God has given? And I ask myself the same questions. As God led me to write these down, I'm posed with the same questions in my own heart. And I got to reckon things myself. Are you wholly trusting God? Are you living the faith that you talk? Hey, talk is easy. And they say talk is cheap. And with a walking, that'll really show how you live, how you're walking, will really show what you believe.